And there we go, live on Instagram. All right, we are out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, all at the same time this morning. It is still morning. Good. Yes. All right. Well, <clears throat> today's going to be that broadcast. Today's going to be that broadcast. I'm going to be that guy today. We're going to go into a lot of different areas today. Um, I really, this is going to be extensive. I'm going to spend, take my time on this. But what I'm going to try and cover, a lot of it I'm going to have to cover in a very brief form because I could go for literally days talking about some of these topics. Um, as far as end times, I've literally done days of seminars on the topic and written three books on the topic. And there's there's a lot that uh, to be covered. But what, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do like a 10,000 foot flyover of end times briefly. And then I want to move beyond that to some other thoughts about where we are currently in the world, in history, in the kingdom, in the matrix that we live in. And so we're going to move, we're going to move through a lot of different, um, a lot of different levels here. And uh, I, yeah, so we're, we're going to go a few different places, but let me start with this. Today is the 10-year anniversary of the Better Covenant theology being announced. 10-year anniversary of the Better Covenant theology being announced to the world. It, 10 years ago today, I stood up at the Welton Academy uh, Bible School and I shared the 10 points of Better Covenant theology that make up the foundation of that theology. Since then, uh, I've gone through, you know, the last 10 years, um, some of it's been amazing, some of it's been tragic, brutal, painful, ups, downs, my own personal life, my marriage, my ministry, um, the way I, I've lost friendships, ruined friendships, gained friendships, um, It's it's been a wild ride. We've watched the world go through the pandemic and um now the the you know all the um communism over the last three years that's been coming into our country and uh so it's been it's been wild just watching um it, but in the background the better covenant theology that unveils the father and shows what his heart is really like has been stunning and for those of you maybe you never came across better covenant theology um i will i will mention briefly understanding the whole bible this book right here 450 pages it's a textbook that has been used around the world it's got you know it's got uh let's see let's see if i can find some there's one we've got little stick figures and everything there's diagrams it's 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 legit you guys this is a stunning um book of of insight to really understand especially the passages that are super challenging, like Old Testament passages where the father, God looks like an evil, genocidal psychopath. How do you understand that correctly while honoring the Bible, while not having to dismantle and shred the Bible, but to actually understand it and understand it through a lens of the new covenant and the work of Jesus. Now, because that book is so big and hefty, I also wrote a pop culture version, a much smaller, lighter version, no diagrams. This one has an audiobook as well. So if you really want the easiest version, get New Covenant Revolution as an audiobook. 
or the physical book is eh, it's about 150 pages so you can save yourself 300 pages of reading and that's out there so understanding the whole bible or new covenant revolution both about the better covenant message and today is the 10 year anniversary of the better covenant 10 points being put out to the world so april 9th 2014 though though that revelation was released to the world and uh continues continues to free people from fear um something else i did less people know that this is out there but the better covenant commentary the book of acts through revelation the book of acts through revelation this is 800 800 yeah 800 pages takes you through anything better covenant that you'd find in the new testament the challenging passages the 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 bringing things bringing gems up to the surface that maybe you've never seen i have just recently lowered the price on this and understanding the whole bible has been out of stock for like six months every time somebody gets their hands on one they they put it out there on amazon i've seen it as being sold for as much as twelve hundred dollars crazy price gouging but understanding the whole bible is back in stock rapturelist is back in stock this is in stock and i lowered the price by like 50 percent a month ago so get yourself a copy of this the better covenant commentary acts to revelation it's a, the best the best new covenant perspective that you could you could get your hands on i mean you think of a passage and you go what what would uh what would dr welton say about that that's what i would say about that get that get a copy of that now we're going to jump into eschatology and we're going to start with that for those who know me a lot of people know me for raptureless raptureless is what i'm most uh known for in the area of eschatology but what a lot of people miss out on is they say well okay raptureless that was great but you didn't really cover the book of revelation you're right i have other books for that the art of revelation is the book where i actually cover the book of revelation and this is this is a small book you guys i mean for me it's 150 pages which is one of my thinner <laughs> <laughs> books i i don't have a lot of them that are 150 pages but the art of revelation why do i call it that because i i say that we need to interpret we need to look at the book of revelation like we would look at a work of art if you and i walked into the louvre museum in paris france and we stood in front of a giant painting of uh the elu which is uh, a war that a battle that took place with napoleon bonaparte we could look at that and we'd have to know when did the artist live what was he painting what what battle is this because is it are we watching a battle in this painting from the civil war from the revolutionary war from the war of 1812 the time makes a difference the context makes a difference what a lot of people do with the book of revelation is they walk right up to the giant painting that fills the whole wall they look at one little red brush stroke and they go that red brush stroke means uh f-16s and nuclear weapons it's like no 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 back up here back up here you're watching you're looking at a painting that's from the 1700s this does not mean the the end of the world and nuclear war that's a ridiculous interpretation to come up with when you look at that so to actually get close enough and understand the context understand the history to go who painted this why did they paint this when did they paint this what is the context you have to have those frameworks in place before you have a chance at understanding the book of revelation and most people don't ever consider that they just grab the painting and go what does this one little corner of this mean is this red brush stroke is it a blood or is it a flower or is it a piece of clothing like you have to back up far enough from the painting to actually understand what you're looking at so the art of revelation i highly recommend it 150 pages very simple very direct understanding of the book of revelation that will make it 
make sense. It doesn't explain every single little verse in the whole thing. It's not a verse by verse commentary. That would be uh, beyond me. But the other thing that gets missed, and this, this is one that um, a lot of people are not aware of that I wrote called Understanding the Seven Churches of Revelation. I went to Turkey, a modern day Turkey, and I went to the seven churches, to the locations. I filmed a historical on location uh, seminar and e-course that is out there that's available. You can see large chunks of it on YouTube. And I give the history behind Revelation chapter two and three. Revelation chapter two and three are huge keys to understanding the context of the whole book because, you know, like you're going to understand any story. If you walk into a movie 30 minutes into it, you don't know the characters, you don't know what's going on, you don't know what's happening. But this book will help you actually get the understanding of Revelation one, two, and three. And when you get that in place, the rest of the book makes so much more sense. So this book really gives you the history behind what's going on. And, it, you know, it's actually, I love the interior on this, one of my favorites of all my books. It's just uh, my, my lady who does that did an incredible job and uh, it's beautiful. So those are some resources. If you missed it, go catch the replay at the end. Um, but those are some resources that uh, I'm coming from. So I'm, this is not an area that I have spent a couple decades on, at least. And so to come from my perspective, my perspective is that the vast majority of biblical prophecy happened in the first century. There's a little bit left over that the church is working on for our future, but the vast majority is in our past. As I said, I'm going to talk in really broad brush strokes today because I've done countless seminars. You can go on YouTube, you can watch this, um, but let me paint a really big picture for you. Okay, so starting with coming from some of the content in this book, Raptureless. Now I'm going to go for a while, guys. So if you want to put your head headphones in, your earbuds in, whatever, while you're painting, working, driving a truck, whatever you're doing, cool. Come hang out and just listen in. In Matthew chapter 24, there is this long prophecy from Jesus. And what most people do is they pick up that prophecy and they throw it into the future. People in the church have done this for hundreds of years. We've picked it up in 1500 AD, 1700s, 1800s, and we've thrown it into the future. But the context is very, very, very clear. In uh, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is having his most intense freak out at the Pharisees. He declares the seven woes. Woe to you, hypocrites, scribes, Pharisees. He calls them vipers, whitewashed tombs, uh, dead men's bones, blind guides, fools, you know, he's he's throwing out every every first century cuss word you could think of, essentially. A lot of us miss that because we think, well, Jesus never, he would never talk like blah, 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 blah. And we come up with this nice guy, Jesus, that's fake that we made up in our head. When in reality, if you remember, he said, you know, don't call any man a fool and don't, don't uh, declare Raka. And then in Matthew 23, he calls them fools. It's one of the most uh, intense, offensive swear words in the first century. He's saying, hey, don't say this. And then he says this because <clears throat> this he was in an intense moment for sure. Anyway, um, Matthew 23, he has just chewed them out hardcore. Then you get to Matthew 24. And in Matthew 24, the disciples who are kind of in shock because they just watched Jesus chew out the Pharisees in the temple court, they point at the buildings and they say, well, what, what about these buildings? And, you know, you just rebuked the Pharisees. What about this gorgeous temple? What about our, our religious system here? And Jesus says, not one stone will be left on top of another. Every stone will be tossed down. Well, that happened. There is no temple in Jerusalem. We got a dome of the rock built on top of the foundation of the temple that was torn down. 
When did the temple get torn down? When the Roman general Titus arrived in 70 AD, they, the city of Jerusalem was caught on fire. It was burned. And as it was burning, the temple, which was covered in gold, the gold melted and it went down around the rocks and in between the cracks. And so the Roman general Titus said, tear it down, not one stone left on another, get all the gold out from between the rocks. So they get all the gold. They're getting all the gold out of this, this temple. And whoop, sorry, bumped the TikTok people. <clears throat> he takes all the gold out of it and leaves not one stone on top of another. The prophecies in Matthew 24 were perfectly and entirely fulfilled. Every single word that Jesus said in Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 AD. Jesus said, what I'm telling you will happen within a generation. He says this in Matthew 24. This will happen within a generation. A generation is 40 years. C.S. Lewis was quoted as saying, the most embarrassing thing that Jesus ever said was in Matthew 24 when he claimed that his prophecy would happen within 40 years. Why did C.S. Lewis say that? He said that because he did not understand that Jesus actually got it right, that when Jesus said it, it did happen within 40 years. He was actually a good prophet. He is not a failure as a prophet the way that most Christians teach it. The way that most Christians teach it, Jesus got it wrong and it didn't happen within a generation. And you have to like twist a bunch of scriptures and make up a bunch of stuff and pull it and throw it into the future and say, well, in that generation or some generation in the future or generation means race. And that's about the Jewish people and people twist and manipulate the heck out of it to try to make it work for the future. When Jesus actually nailed it, this is proof of who he is as an incredible, not only divine son of God, but also as an incredible prophet. He nailed it as usual, 100%. He said it would happen within a generation. It did happen within a generation. Then people go, well, what do you mean? There's this verse that says, uh, you know, the sun will turn to darkness and moon and the blood and the signs in the heavens. And we've been hearing about it for weeks about the eclipse. Every time that's used as a metaphor prophetically in the scripture, it is about declaring judgment on Jerusalem. These are the same pictures that were used in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Lamentations, in Isaiah, declaring judgment over Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 BC when they came in and destroyed the first temple. So then when Jesus is using the same pictures and the authors in the New Testament are using the same pictures, every Jewish person in the first century goes, oh, we know what he's talking about, destruction of Jerusalem. We had these from 500 years ago. When those prophets declared the judgment, they said that the stars and moons would fall from the heavens and the sky would be turned to darkness and the moon would be turned to blood. We know exactly what he's talking about. And how do we know that this has anything to do with like government and any of that? Well, when you go back to Joseph, you remember his dream? He talked about he would have all the sun, moon, and stars would bow down to him. And when he was in this position with Pharaoh, and this was the same picture of people having to bow down. Well, Jerusalem had to bow down to the Babylonians. Jerusalem, again, had to bow down to the Romans. So there's this bowing that takes place, and it sounds like world ending, end of the world, apocalyptic language, ah, and yet that's not what's being described, and no person standing in the first century would understand it that way. They would understand he's talking about the judgment on the temple, on the Jewish leaders, on the first century Jerusalem, even... Um, you get further into the passage, Matthew 24, and it talks about uh, heaven and earth will pass away. Well, in the first century, the temple was considered heaven and earth. It is not some place far off there in the sky. It's considered heaven and earth. The, the uh, historian Josephus wrote in the first century explaining 
that the Jewish idiom, their understanding, their cultural language was that the temple was considered heaven and earth. So when Jesus says heaven and earth will pass away, it did. And he was being, uh, he was communicating in language they understood. We have taken that and we've twisted it into the planet earth will be destroyed. It's not what he's saying. It is not what he is saying. Even in 2 Peter 3, it talks about heavens and earth and being the elements will be melted. The elements will be melted. And we take our 21st century mindset and we say the periodic table of elements will be melted. Jesus didn't have a periodic table of elements to be referring to 2,000 years ago. When he says the elements will be melted, the word elements, stoiecha, is actually the elements of the Jewish religious system will be melted with fire. Heaven and earth, which is the temple, and the elements, the stoiecha, will be melted with fire. If you look up that root word stoiecha, it's used also in Galatians and Colossians as a, a reference to the temple system and the law and the old covenant and the mosaic system of Judaism. And Paul makes very clear those things are passed away, that they are trumped by the new covenant of Jesus. So the melting elements in 2 Peter is a reference to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the first century. Heaven and earth passing away in Matthew 24 is a reverence to the temple being destroyed in Jerusalem in the first century. There's so many more, guys. I literally, I go through every single verse in 2 Peter 3, in Matthew 24, in the book Rapturalist. If, if you want to, go to johnwelton.com, J-O-N-W-E-L-T-O-N. You can download a free PDF of the book. Spend no money and get this stuff. Get this knowledge. You guys don't have to miss out and say, well, you know, he's, he's just trying to sell his book. Get the book for free. You need to know this. You need to be free of this fear. I am not trying to sell you 12 left behind books and a movie with Nicolas Cage and Kirk Cameron. I am not trying to pitch you on something to make some money out of, you know, buy my book about the end times. No. If you want a physical copy, go get it. If you want an audiobook, it's available. If you want it for free, go download the PDF and get into it. I had one guy tell me, literally a pastor from uh, oh Scotland or Ireland. I'm sorry, I don't remember which one, but he told me, man, I couldn't put it down. I had it on my phone. I was reading it. I was reading it for two, like two days before I finished it. I literally, I was in the shower washing myself reading this book because I could not put it down. This is not boring theology, guys. Make the Bible come alive by actually understanding it. Understanding it. that That's one of my favorite rapturalist stories. Uh, the man who couldn't put it down while he took a shower. And it's nonfiction. <laughs> um, all right, so 10,000 foot overview. That's what we said we're doing here. So Matthew 24 completely completed. When we see the word end, the teleos, the end in the New Testament, it is the end of something, but it is not the end of planet earth. This is where people have bought into a delusion and a lie that modern teachers teach. The end of planet earth is not talked about in the New Testament. Anywhere, anywhere, nowhere is it talked about in the New Testament. If somebody is talking about the end of planet Earth, they are making it up and trying to connect it to Scripture. If you get into the book of Revelation, it has 67 times that it talks about the world, and it uses a Greek word, gi, G-E, gi. That gi that is mentioned in the book of Revelation is a word for local civilized land. 
It's referring to Jerusalem. When it talks about a third of the trees will be burned with fire, it is not talking about the global planet Earth, or it would have used the Greek word cosmos. Cosmos is used three times in the book of Revelation. Those three times it talks about the lamb slain before the foundation of the cosmos, the whole world, global world. So they had these two words, and John chooses to use the word gi over and over and over because he's talking about a localized destruction. A third of the trees in Jerusalem, in Israel, will be burned with fire when the Roman armies come in in the first century and bring destruction. It's not talking about the whole planet. Even if, if you were to take any one of those things and try and turn them into a global thing, it you know, we wouldn't last through maybe a couple chapters of the book of Revelation. But the pictures that's actually used are very localized. Also, they're the same pictures that are used throughout the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel and Revelation are unbelievable parallels, and they are both about the destruction of Jerusalem. Under Ezekiel, it's the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC by the Babylonians. And he talks about bowls and wrath and vials of wrath and scrolls that the prophet eats and they're bitter or they taste like honey. Uh, he talks about all these different pictures and images that then the book of Revelation uses exactly the same. Anybody sitting listening to John in the first century would have said, this sounds just like Ezekiel. This is the same thing. He's declaring a judgment on Jerusalem the same way that there was a judgment declared on Jerusalem by Babylon. Now, the wild picture is uh, in, in Revelation is that Jerusalem is not being destroyed by Babylon. Jerusalem has actually become Babylon. Now, that's crazy, but it talks about the great city Babylon in the book of Revelation. But then in chapter 11, it actually tells you who the great city is. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, it says, Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Where was the Lord crucified? Jerusalem. He was crucified in Jerusalem. So where is the great city? The great city is Jerusalem. And then when you get to Revelation chapter 18, it talks over and over again. Well, even in, in chapter 17 as well. Uh, but chapter 17 talks about Babylon, the prostitute who rides the beast. And Revelation 17, 18 says, The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the land. And then it goes on in, in chapter 18, and it talks about, Woe to you, the great city, the mighty city of Babylon. Woe to you, great city. It even describes, dressed in fine linen, purple, scarlet, glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. Why is that description there? Because that's what the priests in Jerusalem would wear as the priests of the temple. They're wearing this description that, that uh, John gives us in the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the book of Revelations, period, It's or plural. It's the book of the revelation of of Jesus Christ. What is revelation? Revelation is unveiling. That's apocalypsis. It's to unveil. What is Jesus unveiling? Well, he's finally removing in 70 AD the old covenant temple, Jewish, Pharisee, Mosaic covenant system is being once and for all annihilated finally and, and permanently. And actually, back in Hebrews, uh, act, Hebrews uh, ten thirteen says something really, really interesting. Mm. 
<laughs> Looking for it. Hang on just a moment. Oh, I said it wrong. 8.13. I threw myself off. Hang on, guys. Hebrews 8.13 says, By calling this covenant new, he's made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. The book of Hebrews was written in the late 60s AD. And here he's saying the new covenant, which was created at the cross, is new and it's made the old one obsolete and outdated, which is the Mosaic covenant. So the cross made a new covenant. It made the old one obsolete and outdated. But then it says, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. How is it soon disappearing? And it's 35 years after the cross. Because they knew the prophecy of Jesus. The destruction of Jerusalem was coming. And this was going to remove the old covenant once and for all. See, what happened at the cross and what happened at 70 AD were two parts of the event of changing out the covenant. The last days were the last days of the Mosaic covenant. The last days are not about the last days of planet Earth. The end of the age is about a switching of ages from the Mosaic age of the old covenant to the kingdom age of the new covenant. This transition is the transition in the New Testament that all of the authors talk about. There's no other end of the world, end of the age that is referenced in the New Testament. Even in Matthew 24, verse 3, where it says, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? According to the King James translation, it has been corrected by all modern translations because it's the Greek word aeon. Aeon means age. It's not cosmos. It's not the end of the planet Earth. It's the end of the age of the old covenant. That is what is referenced always and only in the New Testament. There is no end of the planet Earth in the New Testament. Now, if we want to actually look for signs, now, how? what are we doing here then? If we're not waiting for the end of the planet Earth, what are we doing here? If we've been on this planet for the last 2,000 years as the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the people of God with a mission. On earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said to pray this prayer that it would be on earth as it is in heaven. So we're actually meant to bring what is in heaven into the earth. Is there poverty in heaven? No. Is there slavery in heaven? No. Is there uh, sickness and disease and illness in heaven? No. So bring that reality into this reality. See, the uh, apostolic mission in the New Testament is to expand, advance, and grow the kingdom into the earth. Jesus said in Matthew 13, he gave different pictures of it. He said the kingdom is like leaven that is worked into the dough, 60 pounds of dough, and it works its way through the whole batch of dough until the whole batch of dough is leavened. This is the work of the kingdom that's taken us 2,000 years it might take us 2,000 more if we don't get our heads on straight and actually start doing what we're supposed to be doing. The kingdom advancing is what we're here to do. The other part picture he gives is of the mustard seed. He says the mustard seed is the smallest seed, but it grows into the largest bush, bush and then turns into the largest tree in the garden, which becomes a place of rest for birds to come and nest in it. This is a picture of the kingdom. See, the kingdom is not a, like a skyscraper that one day after the rapture and the Antichrist and the seven-year tribulation and all of the other made-up stuff is going to somehow drop out of the sky and land on the planet. And yay, the kingdom's here. No, it's like a mustard seed. It's growing gradually this whole time as we expand and grow and advance the kingdom and overcome evil with good and light overcomes darkness. This is part of what we're here to do. This is our process. So as we're doing that, 
we take steps toward freedom, toward personal responsibility, toward liberty, toward the kingdom, and advancing and bringing heaven into the earth. This is what we're here doing. In this process, it is, it is about the sun's maturing. It's about uh, Romans 8, where it talks about the whole earth is groaning for the sons of God to come forth and be manifest. See, we're not waiting for some sign of the time, scary, you know, end of the world thing. Even the stuff that's been combined to create an antichrist in a seven-year tribulation, it's wild when you really start digging into this. And again, this is in Rapturalist. I go into D Daniel, I go into 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and I, I cover these topics. But Matthew Henry, this set right here, this green one, Matthew Henry, one of the most famous Bible commentaries, he talked about in the 1800s when he wrote his commentary that in Daniel 9, it gives the most incredible, beautiful, uh, expansive prophecy of Jesus as the Messiah in the entire Old Testament. And you know what most modern teachers have done? They've turned that prophecy into a prophecy about the Antichrist the prince of peace that will come, who will form a covenant, and then he'll break it in seven years and all this stuff. They've turned it into, this is the Antichrist. No, it is not the Antichrist. It's actually Jesus Christ. And what Jesus did in Daniel 9 and his fulfillment of it is incredible. I mean, mind-blowing fulfillment of that passage. And yet, uh, modern teachers have no understanding of Daniel 9 and what Jesus actually did to fulfill that. So we got to understand Daniel 9. The, if you start thinking, well, what about the seven-year tribulation? There's no seven-year time period listed anywhere in the entire uh, book of Revelation. Most people think it's in the book of Revelation. It's not. Look up seven years in Revelation. You will not find it. Where did we get the seven years? The seven years comes from Daniel 9. The seven years in Daniel 9 is about Jesus. It has nothing to do with the end of the world. It has nothing to do with the book of Revelation. It has nothing to do with seven years of hell on earth. The Daniel 9 prophecy about Jesus is not the Antichrist. Well, what about the Antichrist? Isn't that in the book of Revelation? No. Look up the word Antichrist. It is used in 1 John and 2 John. It is nowhere in the book of Revelation. The Antichrist mentioned in 1 John and 2 John is talking about first century Gnosticism. First century Gnosticism said that Jesus came as sort of like a ghost and he didn't have a physical body because the Gnostics believed that the physical body was evil. And that's why when John opens 1 John, he says, Jesus, whom we've known, whom we've seen, whom we've touched, whom we've been with, he's he's he starts the book with, Jesus had a physical body. And as you read through the book of 1 John, he actually says those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh are antichrist. He is saying the Gnostic cult of the first century that denied that Jesus came in the body, they are of the antichrist spirit. That is not some one individual named Nikolai Carpathia who's going to show up in our future or Barack Obama or Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whoever you hate right now that's going to take over the world and be the one world ruler. It's not in there. The Antichrist is the Gnostic teaching of the first century that Jesus did not come in the flesh. Well, what about the beast? Isn't the, isn't the beast a thing? Yes. In the book of Revelation, it talks about a person named called the beast. And in the first 700 years of church history, all commentators and authors that talked about it knew that the author of Revelation is talking about Nero. Everybody knew this. Everybody understood it for the first 700 years. We lost track of it, and now it's Nikolai Carpathia. But the beast, it's very clear. When you start going through Revelation 17, Revelation 13, and you understand the history, you understand the context, 
there was at that time in the first century, you'd go to a place called the Agora, which is where you'd buy and sell and trade and where you get food. And it was the public market. And to get in, there was a statue, a huge statue of the whoever the uh, Caesar was at the time. And at the foot of the giant statue, there would be animals being sacrificed and burned on an altar. You had to take some ashes and rub it on your on your hand or on your forehead. And that meant you were now able to go in and buy and sell and trade. If you're a Christian in the first century, this is very important information because Jesus is telling you in the book of Revelation, I have marked you. Do not take the mark of Nero. Do not take that mark to go in and buy and sell or trade, which also is going to create a tremendous problem because if you're if you're denying your allegiance to the Roman Empire and to Nero and not worshiping him, you are a traitor. You are endangering your family. How are you going to feed your family? I mean, this is this is creating a very rough situation in your life as a first century Christian. So the beast in Revelation is Nero. The Antichrist in First John is the Gnostic false teaching. The Antichrist, Prince of Peace person in Daniel 9 is actually about Jesus. And then the law, uh, the lawless one in 2 Thessalonians 2 uh, is, is a historical figure. I'll tell you about in just a moment. But what happens is the modern teacher, they jam these four things together and say, this is the future global ruler. No, those four things have nothing to do with each other. They are separate things, separate contexts, separate understandings. And once you actually understand them, they, they are not pointing to a future global ruler either. Second Thessalonians 2 talks about the man of sin and that he's being held back and that when the, the um, restrainer is removed, that then he will be fully released and he will do his, his lawless deeds. Well, see, this was actually understood in the first century in the context of Ananias, the high priest, was actually very good at uh, bringing peace between the Jewish people and Rome. He had brought peace multiple times between the Jewish people and Rome. He was the restrainer. And when you get to uh, the lawless one, that was actually a nickname for a man named John Levi. And this is talked about in the book of Josephus. In Josephus, it gives us the story of John Levi. And John Levi, what he did is he went into the temple. He had um, 40,000, I believe it was, 40,000 Idumean soldiers he brought into the temple. He set up a throne in the temple. He sat down and he said, I am God, and I'm going to perform signs and wonders for you. And to prove your allegiance to me, to prove that you believe in me as your God, I want you to go and burn all the storehouses of food. Now, they are under siege in Jerusalem by the Roman armies sitting outside the, the building. It's around the Day of Atonement. So people have come in from all over the country. So inside Jerusalem at the time, there's about a million and a half people. I think it was 1.3 million that are in, in Jerusalem at the time. And he says, burn all the food to prove that you believe in me, that I am your God. And so they go out and they burn all the storehouses of food. So if you're under siege inside a walled fortress city and your reserves of food have now been all burned up, you're creating quite a problem for yourself. They burn the food and then a plague breaks out. People are starving to death. There's a famine that breaks out. The dead bodies are there. So then sickness breaks out. So now there's a plague ripping through the city. By the time the Roman general Titus broke the wall down and came through the door into Jerusalem, the flat top roofs all over Jerusalem were stacked high with dead bodies from the famine and then the plague that had ripped through. He said he could not place his foot on the ground in the street because of how much it was strewn with dead bodies. The streets are filled with dead bodies. The flat top roofs are stacked with dead bodies. 
the people that were remaining in Jerusalem at that time were like specters, he called them, like specters, like a ghost. Uh, people at that point were uh, just, just almost nothing left to them. This is not a real fight between Jerusalem and the Roman army. The Roman army came in and they would just cut in half whoever was left. And why were they just cutting them in half? Well, because a lot of these people had taken whatever gold or jewels they could get a hold of and they'd swallow them to think, maybe I can escape with some riches and I'll poop it out later and I'll have something and I'll be able to escape. So they're just chopping people in half to get that that treasure out of them. Um, the If you remember in Matthew, it talks about uh, two men walking in a field, one would be gone and the other would be left standing. Well, this was a typical practice as Rome would approach a city to destroy it is they would find whoever's out in the field and they would just cut one of them down and just decapitate them or cut them in half and let the other one go. And the other one who was let go would then run back and tell the city to be terrified. The Romans are coming and we better do whatever they say, obey, open the gates, surrender. It was a, it was a psychological warfare that they would do. It has nothing to do with a rapture. There is no rapture. There's no rapture. This is why the book's called Raptureless. Raptureless. See, all this stuff is delusions that were created in the 1800s by a man named John Nelson Darby. He created these delusions and put them into the footnotes of the Schofield Reference Bible. And then that started to gain momentum throughout the time of the Civil War and all the death and destruction. And people started to have such a pessimistic, negative mindset. And then you follow that up with World War I, World War II, and the, the, um, even before that, the Great Depression. All of those pessimistic, massive events have turned us toward a very negative, pessimistic worldview that wants to grab on to, see, we're in the end of the world and all that. Instead of actually being responsible to do our job to advance the kingdom, to bring heaven into earth. See, in the New Testament, we have passages like Ephesians 4, where it talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and that these five gifts are here until the church reaches the unity of the faith, the full maturity of the stature of Jesus Christ, who is the head. Right now, if Jesus is the head and the church is the body, the head and the body don't match. The body is sick and weakly and unhealthy, and the head is Christ. No problems there. These two have got to come into alignment. The body has got to become healthy and strong to align with this head. The full maturity of the stature of the body of Christ, the unity of the faith. We are so far from the unity of the faith right now. It is unbelievable. We have a long way to go to get to the unity of the faith. So we have a long way between where we are and where we need to go to bringing heaven to earth. Even the apostolic mission, what was ap the Apollos? The, ap the apostolic in the first century was a ship. After the Roman Empire would come in and devastate a region and they would just totally annihilate their army, that region would still have women, children, elderly people, and disabled people. So they still have some people, some population, and they let that population live. But what they would do is they would send an, an envoy. They would have a boat that would come called the Apostolos. On that boat, they'd have philosophers and teachers and educators and, and guardians. And these people would come and they would bring the culture of Rome and Romanize that new territory that Rome just conquered. The ultimate goal of the Apostolos, the mission of the Apostolos is actually that if the Caesar ever went to visit that newly conquered land, he could bring his boat there, he could step out on the land and go, this feels a lot like home. See, this is, this is where the mission of the fivefold ministry of Ephesians chapter four, 
the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, their mission is to bring heaven into earth to such a degree that when Jesus actually finally does physically return someday in the future, 50 years from now, 500 years from now, who knows how long it will take us to get the job done, that Jesus would be able to step down out of heaven and look at the earth and go, this feels a lot like home. Oh boy. Now, why have we not gotten there yet? Well, part of it is deceptive teachings that keep us completely paralyzed and neutered and only expecting toxic, evil things to be taking place. And so we don't even know our mission. We don't even know what we're doing here. We just think, we've been sitting around for 2,000 years waiting for Jesus to come back. And he told us, oh, be ready, it's going to happen any second. Well, he was actually declaring, be ready for the destruction of Jerusalem. It made sense to them. In 300s AD, the historian Eusebius wrote about it, and he said, thank goodness for these prophecies of Jesus in Matthew 24, because not one Christian died in the destruction of Jerusalem under the Romans because they knew when to leave the city. See, Jesus said in Matthew 24, when you see these things, flee the city, go to the mountains. He actually says in Matthew 24, pray that your flight does not happen on the Sabbath. All the people who pick up Matthew 24 and say, no, it's literal and it's about our future. I always ask them, have you been praying that it doesn't happen on the Sabbath? That the end of the world does not happen on the Sabbath? Most of them just, what are you talking about? I've never, what, what, what? Well, Jesus said to pray that your flight out of Jerusalem, your escape to the hills of Judea, would not happen on the Sabbath. Are you, are you praying that? Um, what are you talking about? They've never even paid attention to the details here. Why would he say that to the church 2,000 years later? It has no relevance. He's saying it to people in a local environment where it's happening at that time. Then you get people who get into like, well, it's double fulfillment. I'm sure all that historical stuff happened, but it's really about the end of the world. It's going to be in our future nonsense, absolute garbage and rubbish. There's no such thing as double fulfillment in scripture. People make up and they twist things and try to make that fit. But the double fulfillment thing especially does not work because with this, it's the end of the age of Moses and the beginning of the age of the kingdom and that was the event happening in the New Testament. The transition over is this world-shaking event for the Jewish people in the first century. That is a one-time event to happen. And then we're in the kingdom age. And the kingdom age is meant to be growing like the tree or like the leaven going through the dough continually forward. Now, I want to make a correction to Raptureless. This book was put out back in 2012 in light of the, uh, the Mayan prophecies. And now here we are 12 years later. And uh, on page 261, I'm putting out, talking about 12 fruits that I've seen about dispensational thinking and what this futuristic fear of the, the end times toxic stuff, what it does. And um, one of one of the 12 fruits that I listed, I look at it now and I go, wow, I've, I've really I've really expanded my view here. I've come a long way. So stand by, I would like to actually make a correction to my to my previous writing. So page 261, I wrote this view, has birthed many silly conspiracies. It fits perfectly with those who believe in the Illuminati, the New World Order, and other secret society theories. Oh boy. 
Well, there there is a Jonathan in his oh late twenties, early thirties, and my knowledge base at that time, my understanding at that time, did not include any understanding of what what secret societies and Illuminati and New World Order are doing behind the scenes. And I've come a long way since then. Now, we're going to switch gears a little bit here. It's true that those who believe in a dark future often also have an understanding of conspiracies and tinfoil hat stuff and, you know, being afraid of all this stuff. But that doesn't mean they're wrong about that. And that's what I've come to understand is they're actually on the right track with something. Part of what's taking us so long on this planet to advance the kingdom, this is important to understand. Why is it taking 2,000 years to bring heaven into earth to accomplish our apostolic mission? Part of it is because there is a system that has been created around us that keeps us from advancing the kingdom. There is a system of thinking and existing that keeps us trapped inside of this matrix-like system. Now, I'm going to use the word matrix because it is just the best picture of this. The, the movie, The Matrix, demonstrates it so well. If you've never seen it, you are missing out. Incredible action movie. Um, if you can stumble, stomach some stylized violence it is um, a stunning movie but we we're gonna go down a road i have not talked about publicly here um i'm gonna pull up some notes give me a moment here all right here we go all right for those who are super familiar with me and rapturous and all that you you just went through a nice little refresher. So that's cool. And to now, as we're going to go a bit further, I want to actually talk about this system that has got people enslaved and trapped in our mindset and in our world, it keeps us from advancing the kingdom. So I'm going to take this just like topic by topic. Let's start with number one taxes. You make a dollar. I wish I don't have a dollar. You make a dollar. I don't have a dollar. I don't have a dollar. I don't have my wallet, I should say. You make a dollar, you get taxed on the income. You buy an item, you get taxed again. Same dollar. You get that dollar from your your, your employer, you, boom, you lost 30% of it. Now you got 70 cents. You go to the store, you lose another five cents on that. Now you're down to 65 cents. Let's say that what you choose to buy with your, your dollars is you buy a house. Well, and you, you pay off the whole house. Awesome. You got taxed on the income when you earned the income. Then you got taxed when you bought the house. Then you get taxed forever on the property. Even after you pay the property off, you're still paying an annual tax forever on the property. Now I'm I'm talking in America, okay? So we got the people, the Europeans and the whatever who are who are listening in. That's cool. Maybe your system is different, but in our system, that's what I'm gonna be talking about. While you're trying to get by, paying all these taxes, paying, 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 paying all these taxes, over here you have the government that is printing money like drunken pirates. And they are making the buying power of the money that you have worth less and less through inflation. Then at the end of all of this, you die. And if you had some money left over and you want that to pass to your kids, they're going to tax that again. Get it taxed one more time before they hand it over to them. Oh, and if you don't pay all these taxes, the IRS is going to come with force and put you in jail. Welcome to the tax slave state. There's no, there's no white privilege that will get you around this. Everybody lives under the same ta tax slave state 
in this country, in most countries in the world. And yet, none of this is in our Constitution. The income tax didn't exist for most of our history. Our Constitution does not give the government any rights to do taxes. Our Constitution says that the government will be paid for by tariffs. So if China wants to sell us some steel, we can say, okay, you can, but we're going to charge you 50% markup on that, and you have to pay to export it to us. For us to import it, we're going to charge you to sell it to us. And we take that money and we fund our government. But our government has gotten so massive and out of control that we have to tax, and we have to tax and tax and tax and tax to pay for this monster that was created that was never a part of our constitution or the intention of our founders when they created a system of freedom in the republic that we were given. So number one, taxes. Number two, pharma, big pharma, the pharmaceutical industry. Now I want to tell you, I'm, I'm a type one diabetic. I rely on insulin. I have to have insulin to live. Um, there's some aspect of the fact that they have discovered what they have, that they create what they have. That's awesome. Okay. So I don't want to paint with the, the everything about them as evil, but they, they foundationally have a problem. And if you go back about a hundred years to the turn of the century from the 1800s to the 1900s, you have John D. Rockefeller. And John D. Rockefeller is, um, oh, I got to make sure my, my uh, live over on TikTok is trying to stop. Hold on. Verify to continue. Just a moment. Please stand by. Technical difficulties. Da, da, da. Oh, it says it has no internet connection. Huh. Sorry, TikTok. Bye, everybody. All right, we'll keep going. My Facebook people, that's that's where most of my people are anyway. So we'll keep going. Um, John D. Rockefeller was an oil tycoon. He really moved the country from kerosene over into gasoline. And part of what he figured out was that they could make drugs, petrochemical-based drugs. And... It was another industry to take his his oil wealth into. And part of that was how if you have this item that you want to sell, how you can maybe actually influence the market to sell it to them. And what he did was he funded all the medical schools and he then changed the curriculum in the medical schools so that we moved from homeopathic medicine, which had been proven and used for thousands of years on the planet and moved it into petrochemical based drugs and pharmaceuticals as we understand and know them today. He changed the whole system, basically outlawed homeopathic drug, uh, turned it into homeopathic drugs being a, a joke, something to make fun of, to mock, and that, you know, the real new science, this new snake oil is the best snake oil ever. And medical training has has changed into something that is really now about obeying the rules, watching out for liability, hawking pharmaceuticals at your patients. It's no longer about nutrition or lifestyle or health or curative, actually curing things, because if you cure your patient, they're no longer your, your customer. So we've come to a dramatically conflicted place in our pharmaceutical industry. The, the pharmaceutical industry also, and I'll add number three, number one, taxes, number two, pharma, number three, vaccines, which is a part of the, vac the, the pharmaceutical industry. The largest lawsuit settlement in American history 2.3 billion dollars. Does anybody know what that was? It's Pfizer. Pfizer. They had created um, a a uh, Vioxx, and Vioxx was killing people. 
And because of that, they had to do this massive settlement, $2.3 billion, biggest one in American history. And they were they were doing that. And so then after Viox, they came out with Gardasil, which was to treat HPV, which is, you know, an acronym that you can help remember that is how to pay for Viox. Well, how do you pay for Viox? You create Gardasil and you start pushing it on everybody. Go take this vaccine and, and it'll help you and it'll protect you from HPV. And we're pushing it on, on adolescent girls who are incapable of getting HPV at that age and in their situation of life. And yet we're going to force a vaccine on them, which that's just that's just that situation you move forward to the safe and effective covid-19 vaccine and oh my goodness the the injuries that have happened the uh the paralysis the seizuring the uh the deaths the myocarditis spiking through uh, at a levels unseen in human history the the damages caused by this safe and effective yet untested unproven and we've basically uh, uh damaged an entire generation of humans and who knows how far that will carry with the mrna vaccine that is now in people's blood 70 percent of the deceased that morticians are seeing are filled with these huge blood clots all throughout their body that they've never seen before the vaccine was released. It is causing massive blood clots that are killing people. If you don't know this, it's time to do some research. I would, um, one place you could start if you actually want to see what those blood clots look like, go to Rumble. Don't go to YouTube. YouTube is so heavily censored. Go to Rumble and start watching some documentaries on what's really going on. One I would recommend is called Died Suddenly. Died Suddenly. You can see it over on Rumble. Um, very disturbing, but you know, truth and reality are very disturbing. So uh, taxes, big pharma, vaccines. Next, we'll look at farming. Our farming practices, our food, our food supply, and what has happened to it. Michael Pollan, who is kind of a left-wing liberal investigative journalist who used to work for, I believe it was The Atlantic or The New York Times, uh, he did this whole book, um, well, it was called In the Defense of Food, and he went and he dug into the history behind our farming practices. And what he found is that uh, Bayer, which is the company that we mostly know now for like headaches and aspirin and, and headache medicine is they're what they're most famous for. Bayer and Monsanto used to be a joined company. They were one thing. And back in World War I, they actually are the company that created mustard gas for World War I for the Nazis. Later in the 1950s, they were such a massive company that they had to be broken up into two companies under an antitrust lawsuit that was taking place. And more recently, these two companies have actually merged back together. So Bayer and Monsanto are actually joined again. Um, but nowadays, they are, they are at the center of uh, countless lawsuits because of a poisonous, toxic, carcinogenic pesticides that are used in large farming operations, which cause cancer, tremendous amount of cancer, such as the gliophosphate lawsuit. And the gliophosphate is in so much of our processed food, especially anything with starch. You go look at a box of cereal that's not organic, you're gonna find it. Bread, non-organic, you're gonna find it. It is freaking everywhere. And it causes cancer and it's, tremendously bad for our health system and most of our food is like that and when you start traveling outside of america and you go to europe you can eat the bread and you don't get inflamed and you don't gain all this weight and you don't feel sluggish and awful because they don't have the same uh just oh just just put whatever you want in the food it doesn't matter 
the the way that um, the way that our food is farmed in this country is intentionally uh, cheap. It's intentionally for profit. It's intentionally, I mean, of course, it's for profit, but it's it's for the corporate interest only. It's not for the interest of your customer whatsoever. You will literally harm your customer by doing these things until you get sued and you lose your lose your pants in the lawsuit. Then you'll make a change. But this this company is is evil. And what they've done and created in this country is evil. And it is harming and damaging the health, the gut lining, all of that, all across our country and our generations. And go a bit further, corporate greed. I was just touching on that. We can go a little bit deeper on corporate greed. Tesla, Nikolai Tesla, not the modern car company, but the original uh, brilliant genius from years ago, Nikolai Tesla, he created wireless electricity over a hundred years ago. He set up a tower and could have electricity come out from this tower and light light bulbs, thousands of light bulbs all over the Chicago World Fair. And he would light up this whole area without any wires, without any interference, and yet why do we not have that technology now to wirelessly power all these things? Because he was told by JP Morgan and Westinghouse, who met with him, how do you charge people for free electricity? Well, yeah, but what about what about helping people? What about what about actually having free wireless electricity? Here we are sitting around paying endlessly for our utilities, people's electrical bills and how much it's gone up over the last three years. Think about that. And yet you could have free wireless technology. It actually exists. hundred years ago it existed and we still don't have access to it. Why? Corporate greed. There are people who do not think about anybody's interests except their own bottom line. And this uh, see, I'm I'm for capitalism, generally speaking, but corporate greed is the the flip side of that coin where it becomes evil. Now, uh, we have the military industrial complex. We were warned about this by President Dwight D. Eisenhower to be careful of the expansion and what happens and the fact that we we actually have now gotten to this point where, our military has been sent out and we we've, we've we've become aware of this uh especially in the last 20 years that we have no weapons of mass destruction in iraq and yet we went in and we attacked and we toppled the government and we've done the same with afghanistan and syria and libya and all these other false pretenses that we've gone in to do wars is war necessary? Sometimes. I believe it is. I'm not saying we should never be involved in stuff, but we have gotten ourselves so involved because as, as the war machine, it feeds itself. And you look at what's going on behind the scenes, the Rothschild family banking system has paid for and been on both sides of every war conflict since Napoleon Bonaparte. This, this behind the scenes society and family and banking elite have been behind the scenes on both sides funding the war and making money off of every one of these situations for hundreds of years. One of the main influencers, probably the most corrupt, part of the intelligence agencies is the CIA specifically. Uh, we've learned over the last couple of years from RFK Jr. and Tucker Carlson, who have communicated with some brave whistleblowers over time, it's become clear that the CIA committed the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And that's no longer a conspiracy. It is reality. And the more you pay attention, the more you become aware that they've gone in and, and toppled governments. It has been 
uh, proven, documented, and and uh, admitted that they've done that in at least 50 countries. It, the war in Ukraine that's going on right now, actually back under Victoria Nuland in 2014, the CIA and our government influence toppled their government. And we replaced their populist president with a new president, Zelensky, that we installed. We put them at conflict with Russia 10 years ago. And most Americans have no awareness of that. So this has been going on a long time. The President John F. Kennedy actually knew that his one of his greatest enemies was the CIA. And he's actually quoted as saying, and you can look it up, that he wanted to shatter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. He knew this thing is pure evil and it's got to go. Uh, you go back to the foundation of the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, who ran it for close to 40 years. He actually ran it before it was the FBI. It was the BOI, the Bureau of Investigation. The BOI, when it existed, uh, it was pretty much the same as the FBI. It just became federalized. And he ran it before and after. And during his 40 years, he found a tactic actually working with the Jewish mafia mobster that he connected with, that they found that they could blackmail and manipulate people, that they could um, put people in compromising situations uh, whether it was with minors or drunkenness or with uh, drugs, things like that, get them in this compromised situation, and then they could get them to do or say whatever they want. And this has been very well documented. Um, there's a two-part series called One Nation Under Blackmail. One Nation Under Blackmail, Volume 1 and 2, um, you got number two there. You got Jeffrey Epstein on the cover. And uh, Whitney Webb, Whitney Webb is actually uh, the investigative journalist who put this one together and shows how shows how the history of these three letter intelligence organizations actually blackmail people to gain power and to control things that are going on through Hollywood, the media, all of that. So CIA, FBI, corruption, blackmail, um, going a little further, we have media manipulation. In the 1970s, the CIA implemented Operation Mockingbird, which took control of news organizations and began to brainwash and manipulate the American population. Now, uh, when Donald Trump came into office in 2016, he began to call the news the fake news. And people didn't believe him and basically laughed it off and made fun of him. Now, at this point, about 80% of polling data shows that people no longer trust the mainstream news. It's less than 20% of people trust the mainstream news. We've woken up and realized that it is really fake news, and it's meant to brainwash us. Under Barack Obama, there was the removal of the Smith-Munt Act, which was put into place to make it legal for the government to create brazen propaganda for manipulating the population of America. Now, if you go back, what is that? There was an act that said that the news had to be truthful and honest, as honest as it could be, because we were trying to avoid propaganda against the American population. Well, Barack Obama removed that act and said, no, it's fine, just propagandize everybody. And so we've been under propaganda at least brutally since 2008 or so. This is why we've seen it turn from fair and objective maybe 20, 30 years ago to extremely left-leaning propaganda. And that's what the mainstream news is now. Then you go a bit further, uh, Candace Owens recently revealed that the Pentagon actually has a branch that creates Hollywood movies for the sake of manipulating Americans. So far, they've created over 500 movies, many of which 
have been some of the largest blockbusters. Think Top Gun, Iron Man, um, you know, most any spy movie, action movie that you can think of that was a big hit, uh, they were involved. It's it's propaganda and manipulation by the media, by the CIA and, and the Pentagon. You go a bit further to the FDA and the CDC, basically anything, the Fed, anything with three letters in its name is a part of this matrix system that is for brainwashing and controlling the human population. It is anti-kingdom systems of control. These organizations supposedly help keep Americans safe and healthy, but instead there's a constant flow of board members from Monsanto and Pfizer, as well as from Congress, in and out of the boards of the FDA and the CDC. This is the fox watching the hen, the hen house. This is the fox watching the hen house. No real safety or regulation is taking place with any intellectual honesty. Even during the COVID lockdowns, when ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine were shown to be the best treatments for COVID-19, the FDA was posting misinformation saying that it was harmful to humans and it was really just horse medicine. Recently, the FDA lost a massive lawsuit and had to actually remove all of that misinformation that they were posting during the pandemic. The sad thing about this is that they were serving the interest of Pfizer by ramming through approval of their vaccine. The total inbred corruption between these organizations is just unbelievable. You go down, uh, I think the last last one here on my list, no, there's two. Um, inflation and the Fed. The U.S. Treasury, the U.S. Treasury is authorized, according to the Constitution, to manage the creation of currency in our country. We should be using U.S. Treasury bills that are based on a gold-backed system. But in 1913, the Federal Reserve was created. The Federal Reserve is not a part of our government in any way. It is a private corporate organization that creates Federal Reserve notes, which are backed by nothing, and it loans them to our government to circulate as currency, like any good loan shark would do. The Federal Reserve charges our government interest. To pay back the interest that our government owes to the loan shark, the Federal Reserve, our government created the income tax. And our income tax is literally just paying the interest that the government owes to the private corporation known as the Federal Reserve for our currency usage. You get nothing for your income tax that you pay. And over time, the more money that gets printed into the system, the more that money inflates and decreases in value so that we have to work harder and try harder to pay back the loan shark, but we never will. Also, inflation is cumulative. If you added it up from 1913 until now, See, they tell you inflation's at 2%, inflation's at 3%, inflation's at 8%. That is an annualized percentage rate that they're telling you, but it adds up over the years. Accumulative means that if you took all of the inflation from 1913 to today, our inflation rate is about 3,000%. This loan shark system was not a part of the Constitution. It's something that the founders were actually trying to avoid having created in our country. This is not what they ever wanted for us. It puts us back into slavery to a central bank system. In other countries, their, their money says Central Bank of Brazil, Central Bank of Germany, Central Bank of whatever. Here it says Federal Reserve note. Why? Because it's actually the third central bank our country has had. And we we didn't want, uh, the, the Federal Reserve did not want people to see what they really were. So they wanted to sound like a government organization. So they named themselves the Federal Reserve instead of the central bank, which would have been accurate and honest. It's actually the third central bank that America has had. 
we had a central bank uh, that was chartered at the very beginning of our country that had 20 years written in to say they can operate and function for 20 years. At the end of that charter, Congress did not renew it and that charter ran out and it came to an end and there was no Federal Reserve and no central bank in existence in America, just the US Treasury. Over time, the Rothschild banking elite got their hooks in again and they started to push for a, sec a second central bank. They created that, it put us into massive debt again, it put us in financial slavery again. And when Andrew Jackson came in to run for president, he said, I want you to vote for Andrew Jackson and no bank. His whole premise was, if you vote for me, I will destroy the central bank. And he did, he got in, he got in as a populist president, he got in with a landslide, uh, he got in, and he destroyed the central bank system. And for 70 years, we were free from the central bank system with its inflation, with its crashes, with all this, this horrible stuff that they do. And then at the end of the 70 years, 1913, the Federal Reserve was created and it finally weaseled its way back into our country. And they set up the third central bank and that's put us in the economic situation of slavery that we are in currently with all of these tax systems, with all of these, the pharma and the, the food and the vaccines and the, the uh, spying by all these organizations and the control and the, I didn't even get into like public education system and the brainwashing and training children uh, just to be workers in factories and the way that we train our kids this way. And the whole system, the whole matrix system that has come here is not heaven on earth. This is, this is hell trying to advance the kingdom of darkness. I, I know that hell is not like where the devil rules. He's going to suffer in hell eventually, but you get what I'm saying, right? Metaphorically that the dominion of darkness has an army, has a strategy, has a way looking for what it can devour, prowling like a lion, all of that. There's a strategy in place. And most of us are not even aware of it. We're just, we're just living our little life completely locked up in this matrix system that controls everything. Well, what are we supposed to do about all that? What, how is that helpful for me to know all that? Well, you can take personal responsibility. You can start taking personal responsibility as much as you can. As Pay as little taxes as you legally can. Figure it out. Talk to somebody because this is evil and we should not be supporting this system. Find somebody who can help you pay as little taxes as possible. That's step one one of a dozen or more steps. Stay away from this food that's been damaged and harmed that will damage and harm you. Stay away from the medication as much as you possibly can. I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving medical advice. I'm giving entertainment and my opinion, let's say. There's my waiver. But stay away from, stay away from as much of this stuff that's going to harm your body as you possibly can to stay out of this system. Uh, look at homeopathic things that will take care of your body. Look for organic food that will take care of your body. Look for alternative understanding of history and what's going on here because all of it is being manipulated to twist our thinking and our understanding of, of this world. Um, Question the things you see that are being reported. Don't automatically buy into the mainstream narrative because there's so much manipulation out there. And we are meant to be the voices that speak from heaven, to speak his truth into this earth. Part of speaking truth is speaking truth to power. And it's important for us. We're not meant to just put our heads in the sand and wait for the Antichrist. 
That's not the people we are. We're the kingdom advancing people. And as the kingdom advancing people, we need to be engaged. We need to be involved. We need to be a part of what's going on in the earth. And to do that, we actually need to be aware of what's going on in the earth. I shared this uh, last week that when um, there were some, some uh, Jewish people that came to Jesus in the Gospels and they said, uh, have you heard that Pilate has mixed some blood of the Gentiles with our sacrifices at the altar? And they're telling him, literally, they're telling Jesus the, the pop culture news of his day. And he doesn't say, oh, you know, I'm not of this world. I don't need to know that. That doesn't matter. I'm just focused on the church. No, he actually responds and says, well, what about the 18 guys who just died when the Tower of Siloam fell over? Do you think they were any more evil or righteous than you are? And he's making a point. He makes a point. They bring him pop culture news and he makes a point back with pop culture news of his day. And he makes his, his point to them. See, Jesus was aware of what was going on in the world around him at that time. Even when he stands in front of Pilate and Pilate says, what is truth? And he has a philosophical conversation with Pilate. See, many of us, we've, we've just narrowed it down to this one little religious box and try to be a nice person that makes Jesus happy instead of actually understanding you're supposed to be well versed in philosophy in news in the world around you to be able to engage and debate and and have these conversations and many of us have lost track of that especially in the charismatic church more so than any other we're so focused on revival and renewal and and the gifts and the signs that we we don't ever focus on understanding reality and building the kingdom and and you know paul talked about himself as an apostle in in uh first corinthians he said i am a wise master builder well if you're going to be a master builder the architect this is the word there you're you're actually going to understand how to build the kingdom of heaven and you can't build the kingdom of heaven with some of these rotten evil beams of wood that come from the secular domain of demonic darkness and bring that over here and try to build the kingdom with it. No, if you're going to be a wise master builder, you have to understand and be able to discern truth from darkness and, and discern the spirits and be a son of Iskar that knows the times and the seasons. Like these are important. This is not disconnected from advancing the kingdom. It can sound like it at first glance to go like, oh, go put your tinfoil hat on. Like none of that matters. I'm just going to pray for healing for people. But what if they keep getting sick because they got the vaccine or they keep getting sick because they keep eating Rice Krispies loaded with glyophosphate? Like there's so much more to actually get your head on straight and see these things clearly. So, uh, I don't have a book coming out on this topic. I, I'm not sending you in some direction right now um, to say like all of this leads to a conclusion. Uh, I just, uh, here we are at uh, the 10 year anniversary of Better Covenant Theology. Uh, April 9th, 2014, I shared the 14 or the 10 points of Better Covenant Theology, laid a foundation. And I, I'm celebrating that today in my heart, and I, I'm aware of where I've come from and the knowledge that has been added to that, and that there is so much more clarity now to see part of what's been holding back the advance of the kingdom, that there's an entire matrix system that we are up against. And you could call it the cabal, the Illuminati, the New World Order, the uh, uh, Freemasons, the 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 deep state. This is the deep state. What I just laid out for you, and we are at war with this thing. Not just politically, but even as believers, the evil that they bring into the world, we are at war with this. If we're going to bring heaven into earth, we have got to overcome these whole systems 
and bring it down to personal freedom and responsibility. That is at the core of the kingdom, freedom and responsibility. In his presence, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom. Okay, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you hung out 95 minutes with me. Oh my goodness. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk, my extreme TED Talk. Bye, guys. Have a great day. Oh, you know what? Before I go, if you haven't checked out Indestructible Leaders and you want to actually go through Better Covenant Theology, Bible School, and be part of the personal coaching group, come check it out. Go over to indestructibleleaders.com and join us. I always forget to promote stuff. Just all the books are on Amazon, but, but come check it out. We would love to have you be a part of this and see you grow.